good evening and welcome to this uh, second day's uh, international theater webinar, Natya Yagya's last session with two of the most famous personalities and two of the most I mean, endearing personalities I have ever known in my life. That is Dr. Malika Sarabhai and Anet Lade. Dr. Malika Sarabhai is a very, very famous Indian classical dancer theater practitioner and Anit Lade has also trained in Kathakali in India and stayed here for many years and practices dance, contemporary dance um, in Paris, France. So welcome both of you. Thank you very, very much uh, for accepting our invitation and to be with us today. My first question today is that what is the importance of cultural exchange and cross-cultural dialogue and exposure in the field of arts, and how relevant is it in today's times and why? We have a lot of young students who are studying performing arts, especially theater and dance, who are watching this conference live today, and also a lot of as, uh, youth aspiring to become artists, whether formally trained or not. But I'm sure that this entire interaction today is going to expose them to a lot of ground reality, and it will also give them a lot of inspiration. So also please keep that audience in mind. Annette, why don't you start? Oh, okay. Um, I, I would argue that uh, the peak uh, period for cross-cultural or intercultural um, endeavors and dynamics was perhaps uh, during the eight, 1980s. I don't know if you would agree to that, Malika, but uh, if I recall well, uh, this was a time when there were lots of uh, cultural exchange programs between India and the West, India and Europe. And uh, this is a time, for example, in, in France, this is a time when people could discover all those huge, great forms like Katakali, Kudiyatam, Bharatnatyam and, and what not, of course. A lot of them were organized by the Centre Mondapa in Paris, if I, if I recall well. And uh, after a few years of this, uh, this uh, uh, exposure to those incredible forms, uh, some artists in France and elsewhere um, started creating the actual cross-cultural uh, productions that have been done at that time. And here we go together because your participation in uh, Peter Brook's Mahabharata was in 1989. Then also was our Katakali King Lear production the same year. And also Ahyan Nushkin's in Died. So I think this was a, a, a really strong period for intercultural and cross-cultural um, dialogues. So what is uh, the importance of that today? I think it has slightly changed. The focus has slightly changed. Uh, nowadays we talk more about collaborate, collaborative works, mm. uh, which perhaps is the same idea or not, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's what I experienced in my work uh, that was a very powerful moment in the history of uh, creative theatre and creative productions all over Europe and elsewhere within the army. Chintan, um, I think the world of the 80s and 90s and the world today are two very, very different worlds. Mm -hmm. In the 80s and the 90s, there was a genuine curiosity to see how the arts could be used to understand another culture, to not, uh, what's the word, not, not, not to scavenge it, but to genuinely understand and see what could be created new from two or three or four other cultures. Yes. Today yes. we've become a world where we love to hate. We talk of being one world with the internet and so on, but divisiveness and hatred of the other, whether it's here in India or it's in France or it's in, it's in anywhere else, has become the norm of the day. We talk one thing, we do a completely other thing. And many 
collaborations today or many intercultural things today are about scavenging. You don't really want both to be nurtured or all three to be nurtured. You want to like, like a Dracula, suck something out and quickly make it your own. Mm. And I think, in fact, we need to change this because in today's divisive, hate-filled world, theater and intercultural arts efforts take on an even greater urgency than in the 80s and 90s. In 80s and 90s, it was a curiosity. It was a, a genuine need to understand. It was anthropological. It was ethnographic. Today, it's about saving our soul. We need to make people understand that just because my language is different, just because my color is different, just because what I eat off a plate is different, because we are still the same beings. And we are still part of this earth. And that's why I think it takes on a very urgent relevance that we use these amazing languages that we have, whether it's theater or dance or music or cinema, to make people revisit the fact not only as a human race are we all alike, but that the human race is a tiny part of the planet and the planet is what keeps us together. And therefore, I think that the fact that you have chosen this as a topic for us, for me, has great relevance. Mm -hmm. Because I want all your young theatre practitioners and would-be theatre practitioners to understand that when we say from India as part of our pseudo-nationalism, when we say, how dare you comment on something that Kalidasa wrote, mm. we have been doing Shakespeare for 150 years. So why is exactly. it that exactly. people didn't turn to us and said, who the hell are you to do Shakespeare in Kathakali, Shakespeare in Bharatanatyam, Shakespeare in Marathi, Shakespeare as a satire, Shakespeare as a comedy, Shakespeare in any which way you want. Because this is the wealth of the world. This is the wealth of the earth. Right. And I think it's important to understand that today our voice, our plural voices, and the merging of those plural voices have taken on such an immediacy yes. that we all have to jump in and use it. How does it help to know one's own culture better by exploring the other culture? Shall I start again or? Please. Yes. I start. Um, I don't know uh, if it helps. It, if, sorry. I don't know if exploring Indian culture helped me uh, discover my own culture. I'm not sure about that. But it definitely opened my horizon, uh, not only uh, by coming close to a very different culture, which India, India's culture is, but also because through my uh, cross-cultural productions, I was able to travel all over the world for touring with the, with the teams. So for me, it was a, a, an eye-opener to many things, um, to texts, to uh, social behaviors different from here, and to... Um, and encountering people from different ways of life. And also, uh, I learned a lot about me, about myself, if not about my culture. I'd like to give um, two or three examples of, of how this is true. When I joined the Brook Mahabharata, there were people from 22 countries. I was the only Indian. Um, Draupadi, the character I played, has been a sort of icon for me since I was like five years old. Mm. Uh, so playing her was, was uh, particularly daunting, but particularly exciting as well. Mm. And I remember the many months of rehearsals. That you must understand that this was before you could pick up a phone and talk to anybody, before you could Google anything. We were talking of times when a foreign phone call would take three days to get through. Mm -hmm. uh, and you always had the operator saying, uh, pending, pending, pending. Mm -hmm. And uh, Xerox was new. Uh, Cyc no, Xerox didn't exist. Cyclostyling was happening. Mm -hmm. And you had to cyclostyle and then you had to send by post. Couriers were not available. So this was, I mean, this is like a prehistoric yeah. thing to yeah. young people in India. Yeah. And I remember that every time I got into an argument about a scene with Jean-Claude Carrière and Peter Brook, I would have to wait three days and call my mother and say, you know that particular Mahabharata, can you type out, can you have your secretary type out those pages that refer to 
out and I say, see, this is Iravati Karve's uh, interpretation of this, this is so and so's interpretation. This comes from this. this. So, in many senses, my um, understanding of Indian culture, which was deep in any case because of the family I come from, uh, got deepened in trying to defend it. Mm-hmm. So, that was one. The second interesting thing was that. As many of you perhaps know, if you haven't gone to Amazon and watched the Peter Brook Mahabharata because it's an education, mm. uh, there were actors from various African countries. There were actors from Japan and Indonesia from the East. Um, there was no Chinese and no Vietnamese or anybody. And then there were the white actors and actresses. There was a woman from Lebanon. There were. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, several countries from Africa. And Peter used to invite in Indian musicians and dancers to come to his theater, Bouffe du Nord, to try and get the actors absorbing more of India. Mm. And I remember that the Dagger brothers had come. Mm. And I, as we were settling down on the stage, on the floor around them, I remember saying in French to everybody in general, that in India, it's considered inauspicious and rude if you sit with your feet stuck up like this in front of a musician or an artist, so please don't do it. Mm. And immediately, the German and the Poles turned around and said, Mais pourquoi pas? C'est pas, c'est, c'est pas du tout en question de respect. Mm. And the Africans and the Asians immediately knew what I was talking about. Yes. And didn't question it, understood And I found in understanding cultures that the ancient cultures of the colored nations share a lot that we don't really talk about because we are all Eurocentric. Mm. But this whole question, for instance, in Japan of bowing as you go into a temple is the same as us. Our doors in ancient temples are made shorter so that even if you don't want to bow to go in, in a Haveli, for instance, you bow Mm -hmm. and go in therefore paying your respect. But this sort of understanding I found was Mm. much more with people of color from ancient countries. Mm. And the third thing is that when I was creating a piece with Jonathan Hollander's dance company in New York called the Battery Dance Company called Songs of Tagore, it was for me fascinating to see Jonathan composing on his contemporary dancers to a beautiful woman singer singing Tagore and not necessarily with explanations at all. And he's creating on me and the interaction of the audience seeing me dance Tagore, choreographed by a contemporary person and white and black dancers dance Tagore, again choreographed by. And the interaction between the audience and me and the dancers and me and the musicians and me for me was a learning experience. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting experience to see where the different nuances fit and where at some point you say, okay, for this work, this level of understanding is okay. You don't really need to go deeper because we don't have the time or it's not necessary. And these were for me the learning experiences. The most important being how to defend what my belief in Indianness is. Yes. Brilliant. And because especially you talk about, you know, uh, working abroad, whether it was with Brew, whether it was uh, recently with Jonathan Hollander, I have another question that is coming quite in thin line with that. That What have you learned while working in other countries that, according to you, is not part of the usual professional culture in your country? I think for um, a Western person like me, the first very different thing was the relation to gurus. Mm. Uh, we don't have this notion in our French culture and in our French approach of theatre, for example. Mm. So that was a very big discovery for me. Uh, and being in relation with a, a teacher, a master, in, in Katakali we call them ashans, and uh, being in relation with an ashan is also being in relation with hierarchy, mm. which is also uh, an unusual domain, domain for a French artist. Hierarchy is not very much in the French mind sort mm. of thing, especially hierarchic behavior. And uh, the other thing which was very striking for me as well, all through my learning period, because 
in my cross-cultural uh, experience, there are two times. There is the learning period and the, the embedding in Katakali as such, in the mm. classical form of Katakali. And there is the more creative uh, period of my time as a cross-cultural cross um, director. Mm. So in this approach uh, of learning Katakali, for example, a striking feature was uh, that you have to accept those very codified and strict rules, uh, not only in the learning, but in the performing and in the uh, relation to the stories, in the relationship to the characters. Everything is codified. Everything mm. is um, set, sort of thing. Mm. And what was very interesting, sorry, what was very interesting for me is mm. how to find freedom in constraints, in, mm. the, in the field of a constraining uh, style and technique. Uh, which Chintan, is also unusual. Chintan, for me, it's a, it's a strange question to answer only because of the very open nature of Darpana. Yes. Uh, Amma, long before I came onto the picture, Amma was using Bharatanatyam to talk of the destruction of the environment, dowry violence, violence against the Dalits. So she had already broken it. I actually grew up thinking that all artists did this. Yes. More fool me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, and, yeah. And, yeah, because I mean... You grew up that way and so for you it was normal. It was not something path-breaking. It was already happening around you. Exactly, exactly. But what she did tell me and what I tell my colleagues and my students is that before you have the right to break rules, you have to become an expert in those rules. Mm. Your body needs to know how to hold this hand before I can do this or this with it. Mm. I can't do this or this with it if it's a classical style that's been around for a long time without actually learning it. It is like... I remember this from books. It's, I'm reading a fabulous uh, Booker Prize Award winning book called Lanny at the moment, mm -hmm. where there is the spirit of a village which keeps coming back and looking at the village changing. Mm -hmm. And whenever the spirit of the village is voicing, the, the, the book print is printed like this. Yeah. So you have to actually try and figure out where what goes. Mm -hmm. And when it comes back to reality, it goes straight. Hmm. But this doesn't mean that the writer or the printer was wrong. It is yeah. a very definitive way of bringing another reality. True. So if a writer misspells or if a writer joins four words together and doesn't leave a space, it's not because she is ungrammared. It is because she is making a point with a particular thing. And I think for me, this is important. Hmm. So if somebody challenges me, and they used to when I started doing very different work uh, post the Mahabharata, I could still, and I can still, do a completely traditional margam, the whole repertoire of Bharatanatyam, in ancient texts. Mm. And then say, okay, so now I'm changing it. Mm. And today, because I have done that for so many years, I am writing new lyrics uh, translating them into Tamil, putting them into the exact codification of a Bharatanatyam uh, performance and talking about same-sex love, talking about khap panchayats, talking about the destruction of the environment, talking about my relationship with my goddess, mm -hmm. saying, you know, I know you are a brass murti, so why do I believe in you? Mm -hmm. You know, so what would be seen as irreligious today even more so? Mm. When questioning is banned, mm. you can't question your Devi. Who is your Devi to you? We decide. I mean, that's the situation we are in today. Mm. But mm. even so, Bharatanatyam allows me that because I have proved and continue proving my um, métier, if you like, mm. and my position on being able to it. Mm. Well, inside oh. Yes. So, could you recollect the best, the worst, and the funniest experiences or incidents while working abroad? Do you want to start, Malika? 
Okay. Uh, For a change. Five years is a long time in the Mahabharata, right? Yes. And uh, when I joined uh, Peter Brook on the 5th of October, uh, 1984, I had a newborn son. I didn't speak the French language. I had never lived abroad. I had never set up my own home. Uh, and it was the worst winter in France. Wow. Everything froze. And we were working on an eighth floor unfinished building with no elevator. And I was breastfeeding. So there I was carrying everything, including my dictionaries, this, that, and the other, and my baby up eight floors, freezing, freezing, freezing. Mm. And I'm, a, I'm an egg-eating vegetarian. I love French cheeses and, and so on. But at the end of the day, while I was in Paris and we, I had a home, it was fine. But once on tour, to find vegetarian food, to find healthy food, blah, 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 not go to have chips and macaroni. And I found that there were two things that were happening. One is that the Japanese musician who was the sort of composer mm. was a man called Toshi Suchitori. Mm. That after the shows, when we were traveling, everybody would go off to the discotheque. Mm. And I would be in the hotel at 8 o'clock in the morning, want to go to a museum. Mm. And Toshi would also always be there. Yeah. The other thing was that whenever I was looking for a vegetarian restaurant, I would find Toshi also looking for a vegetarian restaurant. Okay. So after about two months of traveling, I just turned to him and said, Toshi, why do you and I not just share an apartment so that we go to the museums together and you cook for me, you're a gourmet cook, I can wash up and let's do it. So that's how the next five years were spent wow. with Toshi me sharing an apartment. It was hysterical because, we, 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 I mean, it was just very funny because we were so different from everybody else. Yes. The other strange exam experience is on my first dance tour professionally as a soloist, uh, I was dancing in Charleroi in Belgium. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the show, a little lady came up to me. She must have been in her 60s then. She came up to me and said in French, I have never seen an Indian live before. Can I touch your hair? And remember, I had hair down to my knees at that time. And I said, yes, yes of course you can touch my hair. The third one I want to share with you was I was dancing in Germany, same mm -hmm. tour. Yeah. And I was doing a bit of the Gita Govinda. Yeah. And uh, where Radha tries to drink poison from her ring mm -hmm. uh, and then throws it away. Yeah. And at the end of the show, an elderly Punjabi gentleman came backstage, mm -hmm. Annette, and knocked on my makeup room door and came and said, ma'am, I looked for the ring everywhere, but I didn't find it. You've lost the <laughs> ring. <laughs> it was just so sweet. It was, it was just so lovely. So these yeah. are the some crazy memories. Yeah. Nice. nice. What about um, you, Annette? Yeah. Well, I suppose my best memories, my, my best experience, experiences uh, mostly, have mostly to do with Katakali King Lear production. You know, we did two versions of the production. And the first one, which was done in 1989, as I mentioned earlier, was done with the great masters of the time. And they were my, my ashans, my gurus, and um, many of the great artists. And also with my husband then, because the idea came from him, Dr. David McCroovy. Mm. So we worked together to organize the whole thing. It was a very collaborative project, actually. Mm. <clears throat> Sorry. With the artists, the men, the men dancers and men musicians. So it was exhilarating. It's, it's a very unique moment in my life, both personally and also professionally, because I was performing with the team. So the, the team was composed only of Katakali uh, performers and I was performing with them. So it was just fantastic. And we toured all over the world with, uh, with this production for more than 10 years. Not throughout 10 years, but all over 10 years. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that was the first version. And for the second version, we had a, a slightly different team because the, the old Dashans were no more. So we replaced some of the, of the artists. And here we had to reconstruct the, the, the production. And I did not perform in that. And, and a new, very exciting performance with me, for me was that 
I was entrusted with the direction of the actors. So that was a fantastic moment too for me. And it was also a moment when my husband joined us again for uh, this re reproduction of the play. So it was interesting to reconnect also with yes. him. In a, different, in a different manner. And a, ba a bad memory I don't have, or if I have, I have forgotten, okay? And uh, a funny memory yeah. I would like to share with you because it has a connection with Dharmana, <laughs> bizarrely. We were, we were on tour uh, uh, with the Cinderella Otherwise production. Yeah. Which remains we one of my favorite productions ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, our two, I think one of the last performances was at Darbana. Yeah. It was a beautiful night. It was, there were stars in the, in the sky. We could feel the breeze of the river coming from next door. I mean, it was a beautiful theater. And the, 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 uh, the, uh, the actors were fantastic. So that was f wonderful. And the next day, we, were, we had to travel back to Delhi. So we caught a plane from Hamidabad, and this was a huge aeroplane. And in the first row, when we entered the plane, here was sitting Mr. Modi. Mr. Oh. Modi was then the chief minister of Gujarat, isn't it? So he was there with his, you know, his team and all. And so we sat in the, in the middle of the plane because the plane was not very full. Mm. And suddenly... <laughs> At the beginning of the flight, the middle of the flight, suddenly we saw this, the, the stewards and uh, hostesses rushing from the front of the, of the plane to the back r in a panic. So we, we didn't know what was happening. <laughs> and we looked at the back of the, of the plane and there was a little guy there who had opened, who had opened his bag and started to uh, fire a, a sort of stove to uh, make his own <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> So, and it's a true story, believe me. So that was, a, that was probably the, the funniest incident we had in, in our different tours of India. Indian classical dances and theatre, they have a very formal and coded structure with their own repertoire. How do you revisit them and reinterpret them for the contemporary times? I do it all the time. I think... Uh, so when I ask this thing, when I ask how do you do that thing, I'm also keen and the student we are present here is also keen on knowing what is your process like. When I decided that uh, I wanted to continue working with mythology post Mahabharata and the reason I decided was that I saw the kind of effect my interpretation of Draupadi was having on all sorts of women. Mm -hmm. From very sexy Sorbonne undergraduates in miniskirts to to women of Aboriginal origin in Australia. Mm. And I thought, what a power mythology has and how it has been used to subjugate women across cultures, mm. uh, whether it is Mary Magdalene or whether it is Draupadi. Uh, and I decided to continue work. So I started reading up. Mythology is also not one solid cake. Mythology has a hundred leaves, 200 leaves. Like the Ramayana has 300 known extant versions. So when you say Sita, in the minds of many different people who haven't been brainwashed by the, uh, by the Ram Charit Manas that is always cited to us, Sita means different things. Sita could be the sister of Ravana, Sita could be the daughter of Ravana, Sita could be Vaidehi, who is the daughter of the earth, uh, and not the kind of Sita that is portrayed to us. Yeah. So I started looking at alternate versions from the patriarchal mainstream version that we are given. Mm. And I started unearthing hundreds and hundreds of versions, hundreds of performed versions. And then I started asking myself, what if Sita were to speak? What, what if Sita were to speak in the 21st century? Mm. Or what if Sita were to speak when the Ramayanas were being written? Remember that Ram is called Sia Ram, that is Sita's Ram. So mm. the equation between genders must have been very different. Otherwise, nobody is called Sita's Ram or Lakshmi's Vishnu. But all our gods are called that. Uma Shankar, not Shankar Uma ever. Mm.
not Ram Sita ever. Sita is never called Ram Sita. She's only called Sita. So I started asking myself what these very strong women would be saying about the way history and mythology and priests are treating them today. Mm. And based on all the reading I had done, I started rewriting what I think Sita would say, given the evidence of what Sita was or who Sita is. And that is what my process has been to find, first to do a lot of research into every kind of myth available, or if I'm doing something like uh, a sequence on rape, to actually go to rape victims, to read case studies, uh, to go into a police station to see how rape victims are tre treated in a male police station as against a female police station, how the judges react, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever research can be done, I do, and then I go on instinct to create. Mm. In every case, I try and see who is my audience mm. and what will reach that audience with this material. Mm. Actually, having been trained in vocal singing and theatre and gallery and puppetry and regular theatre and Brookian theatre and Bharatanatyam and Kuchipuri, etc., I have a large vocabulary available. And when I think I need to learn a new vocabulary, I go and learn it. So I had never done Kalari before 1990 when I started working on Shakti, the power of women. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell the story of Lakshmi, uh, Queen of Kasi. And I thought it would best be told physically through Kalari. So I went to Satyan of CVN Kalari, brought him to Darpana and studied with him for four months, full time. Mm -hmm before I learned it. Similarly, mm. I have learned aerial work, for instance, mm. for another project of mine. Yes. I love doing that. I love doing that. But so I'm not limited saying this has to be a Bharatanatyam performance. Yes. That's not the way I go. I say, this is what I want to say. Who do I want to say it to? And what will say it best? That is really my process. Brilliant. And that includes digital work. Uh, I would like to show you two pieces back to back, actually. One is a piece called Arid, which is about climate change. And the other is a piece called Spark in a League of Her Own, which is to celebrate sportswomen, but also all women who break glass barriers out of sheer grit. And both have been created over the last two months. I'm going digitally because we are in a digital conversation, but I also want to point out to you in the first one added that I'm not dancing solo. The camera person is dancing with me. Mm. And in the second one, what the imagination of the director is able to create when, in this case, he, like me in performance, he either learns a new technique to say something mm. or has expertise in enough techniques in the digital media to create what he created in Spark. So let's see both of those. an earth whose rainforest lungs breathe a tale of waste. Should we dance? Or break into gnashing of teeth at the news of our inheritance?
children of the meek should inherit an earth where the grass goes nostalgic at the mere mention of green and the sky looks out of its depth when reminded of blue should we dance or break into gnashing of teeth at the news of our inheritance children of the meek should inherit such an earth then we ask of the future one question should we dance or break into gnashing of teeth at the news of our inheritance attitude towards uh, classical art forms from India, as I was mentioning earlier, there were two periods. The first period was a, a, a full, um, a f as much as possible, full uh, involvement and engagement in the learning of the, of the code and the style and, and the whole thing, what is katakadi. So, uh, and to, to be very uh, engaged in that, uh, I knew right from the beginning, I knew that I would do something else later on. Mm. But I did not do anything else before 10 years of being totally embedded in the Katakani form. Mm. I want to stress that because this is what uh, Malika was saying. And uh, one, one, I could not allow myself or authorize myself to go beyond the, the Katakani form before being sure that I had done the maximum in learning it. Mm. Uh, and it, it is valid for today's uh, creators, I believe, very mm. much so. Mm. So from then on, 
I opened up a, a different journey, a creative journey that would be more personal. But one very important point for me, an important decision for me was that I would always involve Katakali dancers, my, my colleagues, in my endeavors of, of creations and new productions. This was for me very important. I was not very keen on uh, building my own career as a performer. I definitely wanted to include. Mm. So I started with including um, uh, artists, the same artists who had participated in King Lear's. The younger ones I invited to start on a new journey, which would be more contemporary, more, mm. more uh, yeah, innovative. Mm. And if I may talk about the process, um, my journey, Katakali King Lear was a sort of, of link between the, the really traditional form. It was still very traditional in aspect. And, but from then on, I sort of went out of the form and I, I left Katakali on the side with a lot of respect and still very interested in following what was going on in the Katakali field. But my own journey was different. And uh, if I may give an example of the process, uh, for example, my first, uh, my first creation in this domain was La Sensitive. Here again, it is an encounter between a, a, a Western poem, a poem by Shelley, and elements from the Indian culture, the technique of, of body movements, which I drew from Katakali techniques, and also um, uh, a calamariter, which is a ritual by which you, you draw a design in powders on the floor. Anyway, and this whole piece had uh, as a philosophical um, project to talk about creation and destruction, which also belongs very much to the Indian psyche. Mm. So uh, this was a, a part of the process and um, yeah, that's probably what I can say, and perhaps here you could show a little bit of La Sensitive, if, yes. you, if you can find the images, yes. and also a little bit of King Lear to have a sort of uh, uh, very okay. varied. And, and the last thing I want to say about that is my, my uh, connection with Katakali movement, which started from the, the, the traditional movements, in my personal creations, my point is to go more and more towards less and less, if you see what I mean. Yeah. I tend to, to go very, to look for what is essential in the movement vis-a-vis um, -vis what I want to say or what mm -hmm. I want to convey. This is basically, this is my, my approach, my process approach. Thank you.
So what do you look for when you collaborate with other artists? Could you share some remarkable experiences of your intercultural productions? And I would like uh, Malika Devi to start with it. I, sh I should start? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, my latest production is, uh, my latest performance production hmm. is a full length work called Colors of Her Heart. Hmm. Uh, my colleague and artistic director Yadavan Chandran directed it. I did the choreography. The music is by a British Pakistani singer lyricist called Samya Malik. And in the cast, in the original version, I had an Italian Bhutto dancer, uh, an American, African, uh, African American dancer doing African dancing, and one from Assam and myself and one other from Ahmedabad. Yeah. Uh, in the latest version, which is completely different, except that we have kept some of the songs because the latest one was 15 years after this. And as unfortunately with so much, when you talk of racism and gender and so on, things have become so much worse today because of the accessibility of the internet, which allows copy crimes and which allows hate mail, whatever. Mm. But I think what is very important for me in collaborative work is three things. Generosity, feeling secure in my own skin, mm -hmm. and the need and compelling wish to share and creating something meaningful. In Colors of Her Heart, uh, we were talking of personal stories, so in the rehearsals, People were breaking down all the time because we wanted them to tell us stories of themselves that they had never dared to share with anybody. And this was an extremely painful process. The other one was the only man and it was terrible because they were all about men, the hmm. stories of horror. Yeah. And he then had to interpret them in ways that made it dramatically interesting but kept the honesty of people telling their own stories. Mm. And it was a very painful six weeks of work when people were breaking down. And when we did the trial at Natrani before we went off on a month long tour, exactly two years ago, uh, to the United States, there were people from the families of the five women on stage who had never heard this, who did not know this about this woman and mm -hmm. who broke down and who cried and he said, why didn't you tell us? Yeah. So it was 
very much a process where everybody needed to feel nurtured and safe mm -hmm. and to not be afraid of falling flat on their faces and say, so-and-so will point a finger at me. Mm -hmm. And Anat, I'm sure that for you as well, uh, when you started directing people who were your colleagues or fellow students in Kathakali, there had to be a lot of trust, mutual trust that was created before the allowance and people not feeling threatened, saying, who are you to be talking to me like that? Who are you to be uh, telling me that I can't do this? And I think that is perhaps the most vital thing in, in, in this kind of work. Yeah. I would say definitely. And to follow what you are saying, uh, uh, I, I want to explain why I am working with the same dancers right from the beginning of my process, of my journey. Um, one of the reasons is that you have to have not only trust, but you also have to have an emotio emotionally uh, constructed relationship. And the dance, I know the dancers who are still with me. There are two now only who are still working with me, plus Hélène, who is a French dancer who has been with me for 20 years. Mm -hmm. The boys, the, the male dancers, have been with me for about, uh, well, yes, 30 Mm -hmm. And uh, trust is very important, and also uh, time. I mean, to construct one's own vocabulary, at least this is what has happened for me, uh, I just, I need time. And I need uh, my dancers to be able to understand me sometimes without words. Uh, bizarrely, my dancers so, know me so well that they understand French, even though they don't speak a word of French. Uh, so there is this quality of communication that, uh, for me, can be found only through trust, time, and uh, uh, long and time. And working with the same people them. over and over and over again. Yes. Working with the same people. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That is why I am very nonplussed when... Today, I have had to let my dancers go, some because of ill health, some because they got married and like good women got transferred to all parts of the world, uh, and some because of COVID. And I am oh. faced for the first time in a 40-year career where I can't just walk onto the dance floor and know that my dancers who have known me, who have been here, joined as students when they were five years old, uh, my musicians, all of them who have been with me 30 years, 25 years, and who can read the walk that I do. And they, will, they would grin at me and say, okay, what dreams did you have last night that is going to turn into choreography? Yeah. Uh, my technicians who have been brought up with me, who, who know, and my team who is sitting here know, because uh, that's what I miss. And I'm sure Annette understands that completely. Oh, completely, completely. Yeah. And for example, for me, it's very important to work with the same people because I don't have a space. You are very lucky. You have a beautiful yeah. space. And that's, that's a, yeah, it's a, a privilege. It's, it's wonderful. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. But so I, uh, I meet my dancers when it's possible, when I have partners, either in India, I have residences in India sometimes, but I can't afford to have a space on my own. This is impossible. Anyway, so we've traveled all over the world together. I, I too know them since they were children. One of my main dancers came into the institution I was learning at, uh, Gandhi Seva Sadhanam, uh, the year before I left, he was just a young boy then. So I know them since a long time. And I saw, I went to their marriages. I saw their children being born. I see now their children becoming adults, you know. So that's the, the beauty of that, of that story. How do you connect and reconnect with your own cultural roots? And what is the importance of your mother tongue? Or what should be the importance of mother tongue in an artist's life? I will start on this one, if you don't yes. mind. Malika. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> yes. yes. When, I, when I was learning Katakali and performing Katakali in Kerala and elsewhere, one of the points that was a little frustrating for me is that a Katakali actor doesn't speak. It, he doesn't speak. Hmm. And I had been an actress in France before doing all this. And 
I very much missed my mother language, my mm. mother tongue, French. French mm. is a beautiful language. I'm sure you will agree, Malika. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and and so um, being so many years without speaking French was a, a frustration, a physical frustration almost. And so when I came back to France, I had this pleasure of speaking French in my mouth. <laughs> so uh, language in general, I think language is a very important issue in the domain of cross-cultural creation in mm. many in many different ways. Uh, I in the same way as I think you have to master a technique, you cannot uh, engage in a creative process with artists from other, for example, my, my Indian dancers don't speak French, English or whatever. So I have to speak their language and I speak Malayalam as much as I can. And uh, I think it's very important in the same way as Malika learned French, I learned Malayalam. This is necessary, absolutely fundamental. That's what I can say about languages, I think. I don't have a mother tongue. Mm. My mother tongue is English. It always has been. Because when my parents married, the only language they spoke in common was English. That was the first language I heard. Mm. But because of that, uh, they insisted that I go into a Gujarati medium school, that I do higher level Gujarati, uh, so that I learned the language of the region, if not mother tongue. Amma learned Gujarati with us. Mm. But I'm a polyglot. I love languages. I love the sound of languages. As Annette was saying, I love the... It's like, speaking from Gujarat, it's like drinking and tasting different wines. Yes. You sort of, there is a certain pleasure in speaking Bengali or in speaking Malayalam or in speaking Marathi or in speaking French. Yes. Uh, th th there is a joy in each of those. And I think to reduce it to a binary of mother tongue and other tongue is problematic for me. Mm. Because there are different things that I like saying in different languages that I, I speak different. I, I try to speak as many languages in a day as I can and I really miss it in the lockdown. Yeah. I don't meet so many people. Mm. Uh, I dance in so many languages and Darpana, we insist that we learn the lyrics to each of those languages. Uh, I have this last question for today's session and that is, which would be the three professional tips for the youth aspiring to become artists that you would like to give? Go on, Annette. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so, my tips, my tips for younger performers and for artists, for, for any artist really, come back to a different approach of time. Don't rush. Make sure you go through what you learn in the, mo in the deepest possible way. And be confident, trustworthy, and uh, yeah, I think that's the main advices I could give. Be curious, be creative. Didi. If you are not nervous before a performance, that's when you have to be nervous because that's when you're getting overconfident. Mm. You always need to feel butterflies, even if it's the 50th or 500th time you are doing that. Never be bored with your audience because that boredom shows. Artists find themselves so famous that they look bored and you are insulting your audiences if you look bored. You shouldn't be there. Yeah. And never ever stop learning and going deeper into whatever you are doing, learning new things, always going to performances, not to criticize, but to be able to analyze correctly what it is that you like, what it is that you don't like, why you like it. So many artists I find, especially in India, especially in Ahmedabad, don't want to see anybody else's work. You can bring the world's theater and yeah. they won't come to art because they are so tied up in themselves. Your craft can never deepen or become better unless you're constantly feeding it. Just like you're feeding food to your body every single day, your craft, your art needs nurturing every single day. Read, watch, listen, anything. 
just go on freely because it's something that will make you grow continuously. There are things that you might find limiting after a certain age, after you've done it, maybe your voice goes away, maybe you can't sing the same pictures. But there's so much wealth of experience which you're constantly observing, which you're constantly learning, that you bring in again the wine analogy. The wine age is beautiful because it is constantly doing something. It's not inert. It's 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 constantly moving. And we need to become like that if as artists we want to grow and continue growing. And the other thing is that in today's world, don't shy away from politics. Everything is politics. Mm -hmm. What I'm wearing, the fact that I'm wearing hand loom and not polyester is politics. The fact that I refuse to eat GMO foods and I go organic is politics. Which newspaper I read is politics. Which radio I listen to is politics. Which hospital I go to is politics. So don't say no politics because we have to reflect back to society both the beauty and the ugliness and we can't sit on our little stools and say I will not dip my toe into the world, we are the world. Yes, thank you so very much, thank you so very much, that is very very inspiring, I'm so so honoured and glad to have you both on this session.